ओके डियर स्टूडेंट्स ऑफ बैच ट्वेंटी वन After having discussed the various uh, medical emergencies and the basic procedure, impaction, that is surgical removal of impacted tooth, we shall now uh, see the the next common procedure that can be done in a dental clinic uh, of which which uh, of some teeth is carrying out the procedures on some teeth is is. is well within the purview of a general practitioner when we put up our practice so this topic would be we will be seeing about how the oral surgery can help the with the endodontic procedures though we are learning all the skills the theoretical aspects of various uh, procedures our whole curriculum is divided into subjects divided into papers like prosto oral surgery perio endo like that but when we are practicing in a clinic or when we are seeing a patient patient is a whole the tooth or the complaint with which the patient comes can be of any so there we have to have an an integrated or or a comprehensive or a wholesome approach towards managing these conditions say for example uh for a complete denture the patient might come to you for a complete denture but if the vestibular depth is very shallow then you may have to do some uh, surgical procedures to prepare the mouth for receiving the denture is it not like that um, perio and endo go hand in hand surgery and uh, especially in terms of orthognathic surgery surgery and orthodontics will go hand in hand in terms of pathology oral surgery oral medicine radiology and uh, oral pathology will go hand in hand so like that there has to be an integrated and then integrated approach towards treating treating the patient then uh, you have to know a bit about how there is always an overlap right there is always an overlap you have to know uh, how to actually uh, comprehensively treat a patient okay so there we cannot we are the totipotent cell there we cannot re refer the patient to department of consonando department of perio or department of ortho or department of pedo in your private clinic your clinic is an institution by itself you are the periodontist you are the oral surgeon you are the prosthodontist and you are everything there sometimes you may have to be a clinical assistant also when the when your clinical assistant is on leave okay so so in that aspect so there is always an integrated approach all these specialties come and work together towards uh, welfare of the oral health and well being of the patient okay so in that case what are all the procedures that can that can actually uh, help in treating an endodontic failure or an 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 imminent or that which is going to cause some failure so the procedures that can be done well in advance to avoid them all those things can be can be uh, seen here so this is surgical endodontics is those surgical procedures that uh, uh, help in treating the endodontic disorders okay bye so we have a variety of uh, procedures that come under this it starts with an um, incision and drainage and then cortical trepanation okay then working around the root that is it starts with curettage biopsy root end resection root end preparation and filling you have this corrective surgeries in which you have the perforation repair root resection and hemisection and then ultimately there can be a replacement surgery uh, with extraction or replanting another tooth and then of course the endodontic surgery which is which i mean implant surgery which uses the endodontic implants and root form of osteo osseo integrated implants all these things are there why these things are important why we have to why we have to learn about these procedures it is <coughs> sorry sorry it is said in the uh, literature that an implant and the root canal treatment are equally successful 
So why not implant be the treatment of choice for all the teeth that can be restored with the rest, uh, I mean, root canal treatment? Well, implant is, implant is a good treatment. It has got good prognosis. Okay, over the period of time, it has, assumed, it has assumed much success rate, fine. But is implant a treatment of choice for all the patients? Can all patients afford for implants? Has it come to that level that implant is as cheap as an RCT? No. And many people would, would be fearing surgeries to, to get uh, a prosthesis or you to get a um, material inside their mouth. So, and when the, the tooth can be very well conservatively managed with your endodontic procedures, uh, studies have said that they are successful as well. So, in terms of uh, um, treatment of choice, implants, though they are successful, they are not, they cannot be considered as a substitute for root canal treatment. Root canal treatment is a separate procedure with its own success rate and, uh, uh, and uh, advantages. And implant is a procedure with its own success rate and its advantages. Okay, so bo the both cannot, both can be weighed together, weighed equally, but both cannot substitute each other. Uh, in terms of uh, a bad tooth, we cannot, you cannot, uh, I mean, a mutilated tooth, you cannot carry on an anodontic treatment. And then the only option that is left is you have to extract and we have to, uh, we have to go for a prosthetic rehab of which for long term success rate implant is okay but a tooth with that can be readily restorable that can be well restorable with root canal treatment just because implant is as successful as this you cannot advise the patient to just get rid of the tooth and then get an implant done okay so we have to weigh the advantages and disadvantages when it comes to actually the clinical decision making Okay, and then decide, consider the patient's expectations, consider the patient's economic status into consideration, consider the time he is willing to come and uh, uh, spend for the treatment. We cannot call uh, on and off on all the, I mean, every patient because they may have this, their professional obligations and other things with that may keep the, that may, that may compel them to skip the appointment. So, taking all these things into consideration, we have to be careful about choosing the root canal treatment or the implants. Okay, root canal treatment has been started. Are all root canal treatments successful? No. There is, with the best skill, uh, I mean, with the best skill of the doctor, even sometimes RCT fails. Literature says some, 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 some 18 to 20 percent failure rate is always there. So, in such cases, an extra attempt to, to make up with the failure, to recuperate the failure or to do something to manage the failure of endodontic treatments, uh, there comes the help of the surgical endodontic procedures. There comes the list of the procedures that has been shown in this slide. Okay, we will see um, about all these things one by one. Okay, right. So, when is indicated, when it is contraindicated. Okay, indications, you have a variety of indications. So, when you want to do an IND, when, when there is a failed endodontic treatment, I mean failed non-surgical endodontic treatment, when there is a, a calcific metamorphosis in the pulse space, means there is calcification in the space, virtually root canal treatment is not possible, really. So, then procedural errors in which... Um, maybe instrument fragmentation or you are not able to uh, negotiate with the ledges created there or there is a root perforation or symptomatic overfilling that has been present and irritating the tissues for a long time and anatomical variations uh, of the root dilaceration which makes virtually the root end filling impossible i mean um, and literally impossible and then apical root fenestration the root defect and when you want to when you are suspecting a lesion especially a small cyst that you want to take up a biopsy and see and then for corrective surgeries to, to, to correct the resorptive defect, to correct the root caries or when the root is badly damaged, you will, you will be resorting to any one of these techniques like root resection and hemisection and bicuspidization and then when you want to intentionally replace it, especially in case of, uh, in case of uh, traumatized and avulsed tooth. No? Doubles the tooth, you will tear the, the patient might come up with the, the tooth in hand, um, 
then you may have to do the replantation and other things. So post-traumatic uh, procedures, and then the last being the endodontic implants and the osseointegrated implants. However, the endodontic implants, osseointegrated implants does not come within the purview of this lecture. We will uh, we will be seeing about the procedures that can be done um, uh, other than that. I think we can we can see with uh, we can limit our discussion with to bicuspidization. Okay, fine. So these are all the examples in which see there is a the, the picture A shows a, a broken instrument, hmm? a broken instrument that cannot be retrieved, and then and then there is a prolonged uh, periapical radiolucency near the root apex of B, and then there is a broken broken tooth tooth portion remaining portion maybe uh, maybe. Um, uh, I mean, because of a chronic irritation, there may be some some pathological changes there, and then there is a an uh, overextended filling in photograph C. There is an overextended filling which is capable of irritating the periapical tissues. So all these things assume importance because the patient has already spent some money for the root canal treatment, and that root canal treated tooth may be serving as an abutment tooth for an FPD, which is otherwise which is also a costly procedure. So. Uh, Every time the road canal treatment fails, you cannot ask the patient to get rid of the tooth and then and then uh, replace it with implants or, or some other thing because the patient has already spent so much. So you have to take those things also into consideration. Okay, fine. Also, other than the indications, what are the contraindications? Look at the third point, it is very, very important. The dentist skill and experience. Carrying out an endodontic surgery is not is not everybody's every general general dental practitioner's choice. So they have their own limitations, especially when you are going to work around the maxillary sinus, mental nerve, and inferior alveolar nerve, in which you have the uh, the chance of damaging this anatomic structures, or you have the chance of perforating the sinus and other things. So we have to be careful. So you should be you should be uh, doing a careful case selection. Of whether this treatment is really going to provide success okay then of course anatomic considerations i told you then patient's medical status so this holds good for any any uh, contraindication that will preclude root canal treatment also so the general uh, medical status of the patient is also important so on any uncontrolled systemic disorder we cannot attempt on it because already the tooth is comprom compromised and then you cannot take chances in uh, Trying with the healing capacity of the tooth. So the list of procedures are there. We will see incision and drainage. When we have to do it, you know very well. Incision and drainage is done for an abscess. When there is a because of over instrumentation or something, when there is a uh, the, the microorganisms or the debris are being pushed beyond the root apex. They get lodged in the periapical area and then they start multiplying there and uh, there will be a tissue inflammation uh, reaction for it uh, which the patient can feel it as pain and then uh, when there is a liquefaction necrosis because of that inflammation then there is a pus collected there in that periapical region that is called as an abscess if the patient's medical uh, status or immune immune status is, is, is good like we see it in majority of cases around 85% of the cases, then it may either uh, come out to the bone or it may either come out to the uh, soft tissue in the vestibule. So accordingly, we have to plan. So our motive is to just to take out, take out the necrotic material because that will be the culture medium for further growth of the bacteria there. So we have to take off it and then we have to uh, remove the irritant there irritant from that area so we can we will be carrying out a procedure called as incision and drainage we will see that in the next slide this is a tray setup you would have seen this incision and drainage in our clinic being carried out for uh, various uh, space infection cases or i mean various uh, space infection and space abscess uh, cases so just, just, it's just the same remember the blade look at the blade of this look at the blade this is 11 blade this will be asked in your mcqs or in your ASCIs also so look at that blade which is 11 blade it's like uh, one sliding over another one remember the uh, uh, number 11 and then imagine that one 
one one of the eleven is sliding over the other one of the eleven. So uh, it is called as uh, it is the is the eleven BP play. Um, you look at the tip, and then as you progress through the swelling, um, the the blade enlarges in size, and then thereby enlarging the cavity which it pierces, which facilitates the drainage of the pus. Okay, these are all the instrument tray setup, and then we will see how it is being done. So see this 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 uh, is a is a spark. Yeah, there is a periapical infection, and then it has turned into an abscess, and then there is a pus collection there. If you are not treating it, and in, if the patient's medical status is poor, or immune immune status is poor, or a poorly controlled uh, systemic disorder, patient is having a poorly controlled systemic disorder, then this can this is the thing which can uh, progress into space infections. Another thing, it can it can uh, go into the contiguous spaces. So. Earlier the better. You can do an incision and drainage and drain out the entire pus. Look at the uh, picture it's seen in the photograph of uh, already treated tooth. There is a swelling around that area which can, when you palpate it, you will be able to understand that there is a pus collected there. And then we have to, all that we have to do is that make a puncture in the most dependent area where there will be the exudation of pus will be by the virtue of gravitational force. So, in the lowermost portion where the gravity can act and then pull the entire contents out. So, in that area, you have to put the nick. You have to place a nick and then enlarge that nick to facilitate the drainage and then you, sh you should be doing the follow-up treatments. Okay. So, the next I have inserted the BP blade there and then uh, see the yellowish color of, uh, of disc, I mean an yellowish color of exudate that is the pus coming out. So you can uh, drain it. Okay, the next setup. Trepanation. Trepanation is nothing but what you are doing through the soft tissues, that is uh, vestibule and uh, gingiva. Uh, this you are going to through uh, do it through the heart tissues, that is the bone. There is a pus there, but it is not finding its way to come out. And then it is increasing in size, causing much more discomfort to the patient. You suspect that, you take a radiograph, you suspect that there is a pus there. So you are going to actually puncture through the bone and facilitate the drainage of the pus. pus. So it is called as uh, trepanation or a fistulative surgery. Okay. So as we are entering through the cortex, it is called as a cortical trepanation. Okay. Uh, remember, this patient might not have any intraoral or extraoral swelling because the entire infection is within the bone so you will not be able to see it okay fine so cortical trepanation is that you are perforating the cortical plate to release the pressure from the accumulation of exudate within the alveolar bone see with a with a bone burr that just like what we do for uh, impaction with a bone burr i mean um, with a round ended burr you are uh, approaching that area and then uh, you facilitate the drain. The entire content is, is coming out, and then you can you can pack it with gauze. You can you can also place a drain if the uh, if you find that uh, some more pus would come out over a period of time, and then a drain is being placed to facilitate further drainage. Okay, the next list of radical surgery. This is the commonest procedure that we do in our uh, uh, clinic. Okay, especially when the when the root canal treatment is has failed and then uh, the that the root canal treated teeth is symptomatic for a long period of time. Okay, so um, so so one thing we have to know about this is that we, if you are not pretty sure about why the RCT has failed, if you are not ruled out the cause for root canal treatment failure. Never attempt to do this surgery because you might carry out the surgery, but the purpose remains still unsolved. And then the patient will be having the problem persistent and then he will be coming back to you again and again. Okay. It has the risk of litigation issues as well. The patient might also sue you because you have carried out two surgeries in the patient, including two treatment, including root canal treatment and other, other things, thinking that the RCT has gone failed and then you are carrying out an endodontic surgery procedure there. But still the patient's condition is not resolved, then the patient can go to court. So these things you have to be very careful. And then mm. we will see with this uh, 
and then I suggest you the to read the algorithm. There is an algorithm given in Peterson book. I think uh, I can I can share this in the Google Classroom as well. And then there is a video. I think there is a video. Dr. Rabin has put up a video regarding the endodontic uh, periapical surgery or episectomy in Google Classroom. Have a review of it. I mean, uh, go through it, and then you will be able to understand much better what procedure is actually being carried out. So the procedure stays like this. So as usual, you have to give local anesthesia and then you have to manage the soft tissues, you have to manage the heart tissues. So access is much more important, but because you are going to work in a very confined area that is around the tooth structure. Okay, so access to root structure and after the everything is being done, you have to do a cure attach and then depending upon the condition, either you may have to need a, a resection or root and preparation or root and filling and um, I'm sorry, that just you know, all these uh, things have to be done and then uh, you have to reposition the soft tissues and then you have to do the post-surgical care and with its follow-up, okay? Fine. So, you have to select the LA and then the technique of anesthesia, uh, block is preferred than infiltration for obvious reasons. You have a wide area of coverage of anesthesia and then of course you will have problem with bleeding. So you have to have choose a variety of hemostatic agents that is being described here for to achieve the hemostasis. Okay, okay, fine. When the uh, post surgical defect, no, no, when the when you are curating out, and, and you should uh, allow the cavity to be filled with blood. Okay, so that will that will promote healing. Okay, right. So first thing is that planning an incision. So you have to be careful in. in Planning and incision, elevation, retraction, and repositioning of this of this of this soft tissue. So actually, we have to uncover that area by placing an incision. You have a variety of incisions uh, of uh, of triangular incisions, trapezoidal incisions, and uh, and uh, rectangular incisions and other things. And then you have a full mucosal full mucus uh, uh, thickness, and then uh, you have the other uh, varieties also. So we will see one by one. Okay, every in in fact. Every incision will have a horizontal component and vertical component and there are basic principles that we have to be very careful while placing these incisions. We will see it one by one. So, <coughs> a flap that is being raised, it should fit snugly in their original position. You should be able to cover it after the surgery is being done. So, accordingly you have to uh, design your flap and then uh, you should avoid and, and horizontal and severely angled vertical incisions because it may it can compromise the blood vessels blood supply to that area and the flap can undergo necrosis that, that narrow angled portion can undergo necrosis okay and then it can it can um, give rise to wound dehiscence also avoid incisions over radicular eminences especially the canine eminence canine eminence because over that eminence the soft tissue is going to be very thin if you are placing the incision over the thin mucosa, you will have problem with suturing because you don't get adequate thickness of tissue to suture back. So you should avoid uh, incisions uh, over the eminences, not only the canine eminence, for any uh, eminence there. So if you feel that the, the, the soft tissue is thin over there or there is a bone thickness over there, especially with people here who present with taurine, so you have to be very, very careful. So incision should be placed and flaps repositioned over solid bone, which means that you are going to place an incision, you are opening up that flap and then you are doing the procedure. There is a defect created there, isn't it? See to that the margin of the flap that you are closing it should not rise, lie over the defect because there is already a defect there, there is no support for that. So eventually it will undergo uh, dehiscence. So, uh, what they say is that a minimum of 5 mm of bone should be existing between the edge of the bony defect and the incision line. See to that, you are, you are, you are preemptive, you have to plan so that you can, you can, in other words, you can place the uh, margin of the incision as far as possible, which, which just says that 5 mm away from the preferred area of operation. And then avoid incision across major muscle attachments. Yes, these muscles you are placing an incision perpendicular to it then they undergo contraction and then they pull the uh, wound margins away from each other so avoid uh, incisions across major muscle attachment for us the major muscle which comes in our area of work is buccinator and orbicularis oculi sorry orbicularis oris 
Okay, so you have to be very careful in placing the uh, I mean, incisions around the muscles. Uh, tissue retractors should rest on, rest on solid bone. Don't uh, place the end of the retractor over the soft tissues because uh, when you are so uh, attentive on carrying out the surgery, this, especially for these people, those who are assisting, if you are you will be much involved in carrying out the assisting work, but you will not notice that the, the tissues are being crushed between the ends of the retractor and the bone, which will affect definitely affect the healing. The patient will have post-operative discomfort also, including edema and pain. So you have to carefully see that the tissue retractor should be on the bone only, the end of the tissue retractor, which means that all the soft tissue should be uh, uh, of or uh, sufficiently elevated and then protected by the retractor. Okay. So the extent of horizontal incision should be adequate to provide visual and operative access with minimal soft tissue trauma. So the, the length of the incision should be adequate enough to see the area. So we have we know already that we are going to work in a very confined area. So we should have a sufficient access. Remember, the lengthier the incision you place on the alveolar mucosa, the unattached mucosa, sorry, the, the attached mucosa, the lengthier time which is going to take for healing. So, be careful with the length, just adequate enough to, uh, to, uh, to visualize the area. Uh, what we have seen is that uh, we have a choice between rectangular flap and a, and a trapezoidal flap. Rectangular flap in which the, the vertical incisions are parallel to each other and trapezoidal flap, the, uh, the incisions are, are, are divergent from each other. Okay, if you see the picture, you will be able to know. So what they say in the textbook is that if you are choosing a trapezoidal flap for want of visual access and then the area should be more visible, then you are, you are unnecessarily extending the length of incision on the alveolar mucosa and then it is going to affect the healing. Healing is, takes place much longer. So you prefer a rectangular incision when you are doing an episectomy rather than a trapezoidal incision, trapezoidal flap. Prefer a rectangular flap rather than a trapezoidal flap. Prefer a, a flap with the, with the parallel releasing incisions rather than divergent releasing incisions. Okay, fine. Ah, the junction of the horizontal, circular and vertical incision should either include or exclude the involved interdental papilla. In simple terms, never cut the interdental papilla into two. This is what they are going to say. Don't place your incision in the interdental papilla. Never split the interdental papilla into two. Either if you want to place a releasing incision, either place it in front of the papilla or place it in front of the back side of the papilla. I mean, uh, posterior to the papilla. Never on the papilla. This is what they want to say. Okay, fine. Because reconstruction is very difficult when you are when you are doing it, and then definitely it will affect the periodontal periodontal health of the adjacent of unaffected tooth also. So the flap should include the complete mucoperiosteum. It should not be partial. So only when we will know that the flap flap has included the complete mucoperiosteum, when you are when you are elevating it, you will be seeing the frank bone there. Only then uh, it is seen that you are completely, you have elevated the mucoperiosteum, uh, without which there will be, the area will be much more bloodier. Because if the periosteum is there, because it is rich in blood supply, it will, it will be the area will, will appear much more bloodier. So you have to um, elevate the mucoperiosteum. The simple technique to do is place an incision only after the bone has contacted, the, see, uh, only uh, after the plate has, uh, I mean, the blade has contacted the bone and don't place it over the soft tissues alone. Huh? Touch the blade, carry the blade downward and the soft tissue. Ensure that you have touched the bone. Only if you are after ensuring that you have touched the bone, then place the incision. Start placing the incision. I mean, drawing the incision. Or else you will be rising only partial thickness of the flap. So we have a variety of flap, full, full mucoperiosteal flap, which involves the uh, marginal and interdental papillary and uh, gingival tissues are part of the flap which includes the entire gingival portion you can see it from the uh, in the picture and then limited mucoperiosteal flaps have a uh, have a margin that is horizontal 
or uh, horizontally oriented incision and then it does not include the marginal or interdental tissue so when you are uh, when you are raising the flap along with the gingival portion it is called as a full microperiosteal flap without the gingival portion you are leaving the gingival portion away and then placing an incision and it is called as a limited microperiosteal flap so these are all the various flaps you have triangular rectangular trapezoidal and horizontal decision uh, horizontal uh, flap designs and then you have the limited microperiosteal flap sparing the gingiva you will have this uh, submarginal and submarginal scalloped rectangular incision uh, i mean rectangular flaps uh, this uh, they say that they, they, that, that uh, uh, protects the i mean the maintains the periodontal health or pocket pocket depth and other things those uh, periodontal parameters will be maintained much much more well in uh, after the surgical procedure so this is the triangular flap so there is only one vertical releasing incision and one horizontal component and then the entire uh, flap looks like a triangle it is called as triangular flap yeah. previous slide the length of the incision on the attached i mean attached mucosa is small releasing incision on the attached mucosa is much longer so that will compromise the healing so uh, you choose a um, rectangular flap though visibility is good with uh, trapezoidal flap okay and then there is a scalloped uh, uh, ocean bean loop flap so and then there is a semilunar flap which is being placed in a in a, in a small semicircular incision this is the, the 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 picture the flap that has shown in the picture a here is much less less preferred because it, it doesn't provide actually uh, of much help in doing the uh, endo, endo procedures so so the the root attachment fibers can be easily damaged or destroyed by direct reflective forces so the damage to these tissues may result in loss of viability and gingival resistance so we have to be very careful during the flap reflection in which uh, don't middle with the uh, root attachment area okay so this is how we reflect the flap look at that uh, end of the retractor is placed on the bone and then you locate the root apex approximate you know the which tooth you are going to operate on you know the root length and then locate the root apex start denuding the bone first start denuding the bone and proceed towards the apex so that you will not endanger the other other tooth structures you cannot just move around the area don't create try to create an opening around the root apex area first start denuding the root uh, denuding the bone over the root as you denude the bone uh, you will be able to see the root apex in root apex many of the uh, times the disease itself will be perforating the bone and then there will be actual crackling it is exposing once you try to tip it tip your uh, your probe or uh, periosteal elevator you can you can the, the bone just get crackled away and then exposes the entire root area or else if there is a if there is a, a, a hard bone coverage then you do this technique to expose the bone and then go to the root apex after you reach the root apex you cure at the the, the necrotic area or, or the pathological pathological area around the apex you cure at the entire area with the periapical curet make sure that you try to scoop out maximum as possible you will have a challenge when especially in in those removing uh, removing the areas uh, posterior to the to the root tip that's a, that's a real challenge there but anyhow try to remove as much as uh, as, as uh, necrotic material or granulation tissue around the root uh, apex After that, the root tip will be uh, very well be uh, it can be exposed and then you do a uh, bevel facing facing you hmm? bevel facing you and then you can you can cut the root tip you can cut the root tip do the root and preparation material root and preparation with your uh, and an inverted cone shaped that 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 retentive things that i think uh, dr ananda dr kalyan or jalison may, might be able to uh, describe the uh, principles of uh, access cavity preparations in those areas very well but um, you prepare a root and uh, area you fill it with the uh, <coughs> appropriate restorative uh, restorative material it can be uh, zinc free amalgam to composite resin whatever things that can be used can be used okay so 
These are all the principles of cavity preparation. So you have to prepare the apical 3 millimeter. Either it can be parallel or coincident with anatomic outline. It should be self-retentive and then the all unsupported uh, dentinal should be, um, dentin should be removed. And then all those principles apply here. And then it is done with the retrograde filling. To close up the wound and the healing will uh, it should it should be uh, useful in in treating many of the uh, conditions in which the patient's uh, root canal treated tooth has been providing symptoms for a prolonged period of time. So, <clears throat> with that closes the episectomy procedure. Now we come to the corrective surgery. It involves the correction of defects in the body of the root other than the apex. Okay, we have uh, so far we have been discussing about uh, the the root end procedure. Now it is in the body of the root. I mean, throughout the length of the root, any defects is there, we can manage it. So, it can correct the defects along the coronal and middle third of the root. A point to remember here is that the crown to root ratio. Hmm? Crown to root ratio should not be affected. The root should not be removed much more uh, so that the crown would be of no use after doing a, such a procedure. So, you have to be very careful with the crown to root ratio. So, where all we can use it. So, procedural accidents, when there is an accidental perforation or if there is a resorption defect, when there is a root caries or there is a root fracture or an untreatable periodontal disease, but still patient wants to save the tooth and then periradicular surgeries, root resection and hemisection and intentional replantation, all these things can be done as the modality. For root and root perforation, there, there are accidents that occur during the root canal treatment. It can be strip, mid-root perforation or apical third perforation. These are all the various uh, kind of perforations that that's happened there and uh, you can resort to you can just expose just like what we did here all this flap designs and uh, and other things remain the same expose the root and then do the corrective procedure there then then close the flap okay apical third perforation in which you do the, uh, the the entire area is being removed from the molars and then the resorption and root carriers defect see look at that so they have raised the flap they exposed the root and then uh, they have again changed the amalgam filling hmm? amalgam filling is being changed and then they have repositioned the flap and then closed it so they are the logical root amputation procedures are the logical way to eliminate weak or diseased tooth when however you do it the root is not going to be the, the procedure the root is not going to be uh, treated or the root cannot be treated anymore the root is not going to be disease free then they can just like what they do it for a diabetic foot they can do the root amputation the entire root can be taken out if they feel that the other tooth can sustain itself with the remaining root so there are two two forms of root resection when the entire root is being removed and uh, uh, see the, there are there are two different approaches to the resection so one re re approach is to amputate or horizontally or obliquely the involved root at the point where it joins the crown a process known as root amputation they are removing the entire root and there is a process called as hemisection in which the entire tooth is being in, is being cut into two one portion is removed. The one portion is allowed to remain. You cut the tooth into two halves longitudinally. Uh, one portion is removed. The other portion is allowed to remain. When both portions are allowed to remain. It is called as bicuspidization or bisection. So you may be uh, asked to uh, write the differences between this uh, corrective surgery procedures uh, in the OSPs or in your in your short notes or other things. Okay, so you have to know the difference. It is called as bicuspidization, in which the tooth is split into two and then they are allowed to function as separate tooths, separate teeth. Okay, okay, so that um, the remaining segments that leaves them is here to clean and maintain it. So to this, I think uh, we have almost uh, covered the relevant surgical procedures. Yeah, so fine. So these are all the various surgical procedures, though these corrective surgery procedures are not being done routinely now because we have an other choice of, uh, of, of implants and other FPDs and other things. But um, starting from incision and drainage till uh, epistectomy, these 
uh, procedures are routinely being carried out in the daily practice. So it is it is uh, good for you to know and understand the concept and acquire some skill uh, of uh, uh, doing the ep episectomy procedures. Yes, uh, carrying out an episectomy procedure for a general practitioner around the incisors, uh, especially maxillary uh, anteriors and uh, mandibular anteriors is quite is quite successful because uh, you don't have much vital uh, structures there. You can you can you have some sufficient amount of bone so you can hold atom procedures there but when it goes to the posterior side then you can i think you can you can refer to specialist so in that case you have to be careful in deciding which case i am going to take up and which case i am not going to take up again uh, depends on how well you collaborate with your fellow consultant okay in managing these things okay fine so thank you have a good day stay safe and then hoping you hoping to see you all uh, very soon